Praise the Lord. Good morning. Welcome to another edition of uh, Berean Chapel of Detroit, our Sunday morning service. We're so glad that you are joining us. To all the Bereanites, good morning. Those of you who are uh, watching by watch parties, thank you first to the host for inviting your friends and family to join. And I would ask you if you are participating as part of a watch party that you would like our YouTube or Facebook page so that you can get notices directly about the activities here. Uh, if this is your first time joining us, our mission here is to know God, to please God, and to make Christ known. And our services are designed to help equip believers with an understanding of God's word and his truth and to um, encourage those who may not have a relationship with Jesus Christ uh, to give you an understanding of who he is, the amazing love that he has for you, and the price that he has paid for you to be truly be free. Uh, we invite your questions as we go through uh, the, the scriptures, um, and uh, we invite you. We'll be coming back for in-person services soon, and we want to make you aware of that. Uh, we're located at 8422 Pembroke on the northwest side of the city of Detroit. We're at the corner of Pembroke and Cherry Lawn, uh, located between West Outer Drive and 8 Mile, Livernoy, and Wyoming. So we invite you, when you have opportunity, you'll be able to come out and visit us in person. Uh, but certainly you're welcome to continue to join us online. And I know some of you are joining us from great distance. We've got some folks from uh, New Mexico, from Washington, from New York, uh, and uh, many other places, both near and far. And we appreciate you attending. Um, we are in the book of Romans. We're in Romans chapter 5. And we're looking at Paul's explanation of the doctrine really of faith and uh, today we'll be in chapter 5 uh, let's have a word of prayer and then we'll get into the details of it eternal God we thank you for this opportunity to spend time in your word we invite your Holy Spirit to speak to each of our hearts for believers to grow in grace and in the knowledge of Christ and Lord if by chance there is one who is watching this uh, for the first time or as a result of one of our recordings uh, may administer to their heart, cause them to see their need and recognize the provision that you've made through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, better known as the gospel of Christ. So we thank you in advance for what you will accomplish today, and we pray and ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, again, we're in Romans, Romans chapter 5. Uh, in chapter 4, Paul laid out the fact that salvation is not by works. It is by faith, and he used the example of Abraham to whom the promise was given that he would be a father of many nations, and that promise was made before circumcision was put in place. So Abraham acted in faith based on the promises of God's word, and God's response to him was based on that faith. When he was ultimately circumcised, that was a public showing of his commitment, but the commitment was a heart commitment. In other words, it's not by works, the things that we do that make us right in the sight of God. It is the heart that enables us to have, by walking by faith and his promise, that we are able to be saved. And he continues this here. If you look, uh, Romans chapter 5, verse 1, he says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God. And how is that possible? It's through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we also have access, again, by faith, into the grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. That's a mouthful right there. Let's unpack that a little bit. He says, first, therefore, we are justified. We are rendered or declared just um, to be declared righteous by whom? By God. It's not self-righteousness. It is God's declaration of our righteousness. And how is that possible? It is by faith we have placed, uh, we have peace with God, and it's through Jesus Christ. It is not by works of righteousness that's what we've done. In fact, he says, by whom also we have access. And I love this word access. Listen, it means this. That relationship with God 
whereby we are acceptable to him and have assurance that he is favorably disposed toward us. We have access. Another way, an example, to give you a, a picture of that, in most, in many businesses now, in places of employment, uh, you don't have a key anymore, you have a key card. And what happens? You show that key card, and when you place that key card on the instrument, what happens? It opens the door. It gives you access to what's beyond the door. It gives you access, in this case, to the promises of God. You don't create the card. It is given to you by the authority, right? They programmed it. They give it to you to give you access. Here, we have access to God, not by our own works, but by receiving the access card, which is Jesus Christ, our Lord. We have access, and how do you get that? You can't pay for it. You can't earn it. It's by faith. And it says, into the grace, which is the merciful kindness by which God exerts his holy influence upon a soul, and it strengthens and increases them in Christian faith. So by whom we have access by faith into this grace, wherein we stand and rejoice in hope or in the expectation of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory now, this is interesting, not only that we glory in the soon coming of Christ or the promises that God has given to us, but it also says that we glory in tribulation. There is a recognition that the tribulations that we go through, the word glory, it is, has a couple of minutes. It's, it's praise, it's honor, it's recognition. He says we have recognition of our tribulations. In other words, the pressing, the afflictions, the distress, the burdens that we go through, that they now have a purpose. What is the purpose? Some of you that are listening right now, you are going through some great challenges. It's rough. For the believer, there is now a promise attached to the tribulations that we go through. What's the promise? Knowing that tribulation works or produces patience. And what is patience? Patience is steadfastness while waiting. I, I, I can endure while waiting because I have an expected end. Um, I, I'll reference, and we'll see it a little bit later on, but it's worth noting now, Romans um, 8.28. We know that all things work together for good to those who love God, and to those who are called according to his purpose. In other words, everything from the moment you trust in Jesus Christ and you began your walk of faith and trusting in him, he brings everything into perspective, even the difficulties that we experience, that challenge you're having on your job, that challenge you're having in your home, that challenge that you're having internally. He says if you focus on pleasing him, even that will produce something righteous and holy. Look what it says here. Knowing this, that tribulation produces patience, and patience produces experience. It, um, the word experience there means proof. It is tried and found worthy. It is character. So tribulation produces patience. What are we patient about? We're waiting for the expected end that God has promised with even the tribulations and challenges that we go through. Our faith is in him. And it is experience, and experience produces hope. Hope is expe expectation and confidence. Another example, you have, sometime you may have to have surgery. A doctor identifies some challenge that you have, and he says, look, you're going to have to have surgery. Surgery isn't fun by any stretch of the imagination. But the expected end, I've had friends who have had to have uh, knee or hip surgery, and they were in great pain. Uh, they went through the surgery. That was even painful. But 
the expected end was to be able to move and be able to do better. And it, that's exactly what happened with them. With God, he says, and remember, he can't fail. Humans, we can fail. There have been accidents in surgery. But here, God says that tribulation produces patience, which is the, abil the ability to stand and wait, even when you haven't seen the expected end yet. And that produces experience, which then produces hope. Um, I had a young man when I did prison ministry, he made this comment. He said, new level, new devil, right? In other words, uh, it's just like lifting weights. You get experience, and the more exercise you get, the stronger you become. Our tribulations actually will help us grow in our faith and strength. That's what this is saying. And hope makes us not ashamed because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts, which is important to understand. The word ashamed there, it means one who is said to be put to shame, who suffers a repulse or who uh, someone's hope has deceived them to be discouraged or disgraced. He says here that our hope makes us not ashamed. Our expectation, our confidence in Christ removes the feeling of dishonor and disgrace when we are trusting in him. In other words, I don't see the outcome yet, but I see the one who controls the outcome, and I have peace and hope in him. So you will see people that will go through the same tragedy, and some will have, even in the midst of the difficult time, they still have a sense of peace and hope and joy, and the other person is going to be losing their mind right, or embittered and angry. What's happened? God will allow us, when we see our circumstances through his eyes and through his promise, that's a better way of stating it, that we can even have peace in the midst of the challenge. Why? Because he has a purpose in it. It says, and hope maketh not ashamed. Why? Because the agape of God has been poured out or distributed largely in our hearts, in the way we think. Uh, when the Bible talks about your heart, it's three things. Your mind, the way you think, your will, what you do, and your emotions, the way you feel. The agape of God, the love, the unconditional love, the choice of the will. He, God demonstrated his love for, for us, and that while we were yet sinners, he died, right? And that power that raised Jesus Christ is now influencing the way we think, the way we feel, and the way we act. And that enables us to not to be overly discouraged, or when we are discouraged, to get help out of it. Yes, Christians do to get discouraged too. And that's going to happen. But that's where the patience comes in. Right? I get to a point that I endure with the expected end of God's will. Jesus modeled this for us. Remember, he was in the garden, and he said, you know, I let this cup pass from me. He didn't want to go through that. It didn't feel right. He was stressed out, said he sweat great drops of blood. That's a whole lot of stress, so Jesus understands. But then he said, nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. And this is what this has given us hope to, that in our heart, in our mind, in the way we see ourselves, our circumstances, and other people, that it can shift based upon the love of God that is shed abroad in our hearts, in our heart and mind, that he has given unto us. Why? For when we were yet without strength, when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. The ungodly, and note who he died for, because some people say, well, Jesus Christ didn't die for everybody. He only died for certain people. Well, here it clarifies who he died for. He died for the ungodly. Who are the ungodly? Those are people who are destitute, I love this, of reverential respect, those who are condemning of God, those who are rude, disrespectful, lacking courtesy or esteem, and see no value in something else, but boldly rule, rude. Jesus Christ died for them, for us. 
All of us fit into that. All of us have been ungodly. And everyone you know that is acting as that is offensive. Jesus Christ died for them. But God, uh, verse 7 says, for scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet by chance for a good man, some would even dare to die. But here it is. God commended or demonstrated his love for us. In that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for who? For us. And then verse 9, it says, and much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath through him. Beloved, there is wrath coming. Um, we read earlier, Romans, I think, 118. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and all the unrighteousness of men who hold the truth or hold back the truth in unrighteousness. Don't get it, don't get it confused. All of the Injustice that you see permeating our nation, permeating the globe. God sees it all, and his wrath is revealed from heaven against it. He will pour out his wrath for it, but he has allowed this brief period of time. It's called a season of grace for those, all of us, who are sinners in need of a Savior. He is offering salvation through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. He says, much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled shall we be saved, much more being reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. And I love this term, the word atonement. It is exchange of business or of money change, adjustment of a difference, exchanging equivalent value, restoration to favor i like to think of it this way is there if, if you think of it it says an exchange of business of a money changer what happens we experience this you go to the store and in exchange for something you have of value you will obtain exchange that for something else uh when i was growing up I remember when the first, uh, one of my first summer jobs, the new watches had come out, the first line of digital watches. It was a gold watch, had a red bevel on top, and when you press the button, it would light up with the numbers, the time, right? Before that, we had just the hand clock. Yes, I'm older. I'm not old, I'm seasoned. But I wanted one of those watches. And I think back then it may have been 20 or $30, which was a lot. But I saved up. I had to get that watch. There was a store on 8 Mile near Van Dyke. I had gone in there several times. I saw the one I wanted. And when I had saved up enough money, I went in there and got that watch. Why? Because it had value to me. And I was willing to exchange whatever the $20, $30 was for it in order to possess that watch. I wanted that watch. Right. Well, here it says, not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. What did he do? He exchanged his blood for us. He valued his value for us was such that he would go to the cross for you and I. That's what made that statement earlier. Most people wouldn't die for somebody else. But Jesus Christ, he demonstrated his love in that while we were yet sinners, we were at our worst, he went and paid our debt in order to redeem us. Somebody, you know, you could just get up and just run around your kitchen table. And thank God for that. Right? He loved us enough. He bought us back from what ultimately would be an eternity separated from him. He paid the price so that you and I could have a relationship with him. 
it says, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, that's Adam, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. And let's be clear, I don't care how nice you are, we have all sinned. Verse 13 says, For until the law, sin was, was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Right? If there's no speeding sign, then the fact that you're doing 55 and a 25 mile an hour speed zone, you know, if it's not posted, then you can make the argument it's not against the law. But once the sign goes up, <laughs> you know it is. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the same manner as Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. So that's the other thing. Sin shows up in different ways, but it has the same root. What was Adam's sin? He ignored God, doubted God, chose his wisdom over and against what God had said. And when he did, he ate of a piece of fruit. You and I may not have violated eating that fruit, but we've all done something that violates the standard and the purpose for which God has created us. And as a result, we've fallen short of what God intended for us. And as a result, we've sinned, and sin leads to death. He says, verse 15, But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one many be dead, much more the favor of God, and the gift by God's favor, which is by one man who? Jesus Christ, there is no other name given unto heaven among men whereby we must be saved, has abounded unto many. And not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift. For the judgment was by one to condemnation. Because of Adam and what he did, we all have his nature, and as a result of having his nature, we are all subject to the same condemnation. And not as it was, I'm sorry, in verse uh, 16, it goes on to say, but the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. And being justified by his grace. What do we mean by being justified? It means that it is one who has been deemed right so as to have the force of law. Uh, judgment by which he acquits man and declares him acceptable to himself by trusting and placing faith in Jesus Christ it allows God to be both just he's punishing all sin and also the justifier of those who will trust in him for if by one man's offense death reigned by one much more they which receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. The word reign there is a great word. It means to exercise the highest influence or control. To exercise the highest influence or control in the life of one of Jesus Christ. What is exercising the highest influence in your life? What drives your decision? What sets the boundaries for that? Everybody is being influenced by something. There's the world. There's the devil. There's our own flesh. And then there's the spirit of God. And when we trust in him, and before we trust in him, be clear, the influence is the world, the flesh, or the devil. It's there. What he invites and provides for all who will receive the gift is a godly influence that allows us to live righteously, that allows us to be healed from the unrighteous deeds of others and the unrighteous deeds of ourselves. 
there's an Old Testament, I think it's in Proverbs, it says, by mercy and truth, iniquity is purged, it's cleansed. All right? You want healing? Guess what? The mercy of God and the truth of his word can provide healing and hope for you and me. For by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. So by the obedience of one shall many be made, and note here, will be made righteous, will be made justified in God's sight. Moreover, the law entered, this is key, highlight your, 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 your Bible with this. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. That sounds strange, doesn't it? The law was given to show just how sinful sin is. When you take the Ten Commandments and you go through them and you see how they expose everything about us. The Ten Commandments were given that the offenses might abound. But then where sin abounds, grace did much more abound. That as sin has reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life. How? By Jesus Christ our Lord. So what's the promise? The promise is, the truth is, we are all sinners because we have Adam's nature. We're sinners by nature and by choice. And because we are sinners, the, the, the process is we are drawn away of our own lust. All of us have lust. We, we all have, a passion for, have had a passion for something that God says no to, and we have pursued that. We've desired it above God and his righteousness. As a result, we earned his judgment and the decay that comes along with following a lifestyle, a thought life, feelings and behavior that are contrary to God's word. There's, it, it's only a downward spiral for that. But he has given us, by his grace, his favor and his kindness, the opportunity to live righteously. He'll take care of our debt and then empower us to live holy and righteous before him and thereby experience the hope and peace that is only available through that personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Alcohol can't take it away. Money can't take it away. Sex is not going to take it away. We need the peace and the hope of Jesus Christ to make life to actually even receive true life. Another scripture that talks about we're basically walking dead people until we enter into a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. So I appeal to you today, if you don't know Jesus Christ, he, is the, he described himself as the way, the truth, and the life, and that no man can come unto the Father except through him. Narrow is the way that leads to life eternal, and broad is the way that leads to destruction. There are a million and one ways to run away from God. There's only one way to get into a right relationship with him, and that's through Jesus Christ. Each week, we do communion, and the reason for that is to remind us of the awful price that had to be paid for our redemption. Jesus Christ was beaten and bruised, and he hung on a cross, the most wicked way that a human being can die. But he did that for you and for me. One, I love this. The scripture said he learned obedience. Right? He's, he's God. He didn't have to. He, he is a law unto himself. But he took on the form of man to experience what it would be for us to have to be obedient and to be submissive what we would experience so we he would be a kinsman redeemer he was beaten for you and for me let's commune together in addition to that he hung on that cross nailed to it shed his blood and endured it so that you and i could ultimately be free it's a down payment if you will 
This is a down payment, this reminder of what was paid for us to be free and to give us that hope that the scripture talked about, that he's a soon coming king. Let's commune together. I invite you, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you have questions, please send them in. Please call us. Our contact information is listed on both our YouTube and uh, web page. We'd love to encourage you. If today you've asked, you've recognized you're a sinner and you need Jesus Christ and you've asked him into your heart, please let us know. We'd love to send you material to encourage you. The Bible says that when you do that, you've been born again. If we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in our heart, our mind, our emotion, and our will, believe in our heart that God has raised him from the dead, we will be saved. For with the heart we believe unto righteousness. The evidence of our belief in Christ is a changed life. We start thinking, acting, feeling, and behaving differently. Does it all happen overnight? No, that's part of the growth process. You've been born again, just like a little baby. Uh, doesn't typically, a baby doesn't normally pop out of his mother's womb and, uh, you know, go run a marathon. But you give them a few years with exercise, they become stronger and able to do that. The same thing is true for us. As we trust in Jesus Christ, as we feed on his word, his spirit is allowed to permeate our thinking and behavior. We will grow and we will be strong for the kingdom of God. That is available to you, no matter what you've been through. So we invite you to trust him today. I want to thank you for tuning in. Uh, we appreciate those of you who have been supporting this ministry financially. You can do that online. Or if many of you have done drive-bys, we welcome that as well. Or you can mail in directly. Again, we appreciate you. Please continue to join us. And uh, next week, we'll be back with our afternoon uh, Seeking Truth program uh, at 2.30. You can join us on YouTube and Facebook. And again, that's where you have an opportunity to send questions in. And we will attempt to... Uh, help answer those, and the goal is for everyone to be able to grow in grace and in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Father, thank you again for this day, this opportunity to spend time in your word. Bless everyone who is tuned in, and we pray that you will meet them at the point of their need. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. God bless you. Take care.